Well, th thanks for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. It's my first Rodef. Hopefully, um, there'll be more. Um, and I'm really glad to see that there's a community here in France that's interested in Jump. Uh, I was in Europe two years ago for a conference, and barely anybody had heard of Jump. And now, when I speak to some random people, um, at least at least there's some awareness of what, what it is and what, what it can do. Um, so to, to give credit to uh, the big group of people who have contributed to, to Jump, the, I'd say that the founding Jump team would include me, um, Ian Dunning, and Joey Hutchett, all, all students at, at the time at, at MIT. Um, the team behind MathOpt Interface, which I'll, I'll talk, uh, which, I'll, which I'll introduce later, Benoit, um, Oscar, who doesn't have a picture of himself on the internet, so that's his, his GitHub picture, um, Joachim, uh, Juan Pablo Yelba, my, my PhD advisor, and I put him under evangelism because he, he runs the Twitter account. Um, and so in addition to that, uh, we have had a lot of contri contributions, for example, on, on the solver interfaces. Um, j j you can use a lot of solvers from Jump, and that is thanks to the work of all these people who um, wrote a bit of the wrote a bit of the Julia wrappers so that, to allow us to do that. Okay, so I want to step back and give a bit of context to algebraic modeling um, that, that's not, not typically given in the operations research community, but it, I think it puts, puts this work in a, in a larger context. Um, for linear algebra, the, the basic operation in linear algebra is matrix multiplication, solving linear systems. Um, and by the 1960s, 1970s, we, we knew how to do this. There, there was Fortran codes to do this, solve linear systems efficiently, um, but there was really no nice way to do that. So um, Clave Muller, who was a professor at Stanford at the time, I believe, um, developed something called MATLAB um, to help his students uh, help demonstrate these linear algebra techniques and provide a nice interface to, to um, to Fortran codes to solve linear systems. Um, that, that became MATLAB and, be, and turned out to be something that can do much more than solving linear systems, but that, that was kind of the origin of MATLAB. Um, and very similarly, at the time, um, 1970s, we, we knew how to solve linear programming problems. There was codes to do that. Um, but it, what you would have to do is generate, um, write, maybe write a Fortran code that uh, generates your uh, sparse matrix with all the coefficients, um, and people recognize pretty early on that this is not a, a very uh, friendly way to solve a linear programming problem. So late 1970s, 1980s, Ample, GAMS, and Lindo were developed uh, to provide uh, user-friendly interfaces to these optimization solvers. Um, so. You really, as I mentioned, you don't need a modeling language. If you just want to solve a linear programming problem, you're welcome to generate the, the matrix of constraints. Um, but if you, well, okay, who has done this by hand before? Um, and who, who enjoyed doing it by hand? <laughs> okay, so that, that, that's, that's, only, that's the point I want to make there. Um, just to give a quick example of what Jump uh, and algebraic modeling syntax looks like. Um, this is a, a pretty simple network flow problem. We are minimizing um, the cost of the flow along an edge to i to j. We have balance constraints and we have a, um, a sink constraint and capacity constraints. Um, and we, if you've been to the, to the Jump themed talks so far, you've seen a little bit of Jump code. Um, so here, here's another example. You create a model object, you create some variables, um, you can index your variables over edges, edges I haven't defined here yet, um, and define their low and upper bounds. You can define a bunch of constraints. So here's the, the balance constraints um, over a list of uh, nodes numbered from, from two to four. So you don't need to write a for loop to write a block of constraints. This is just a very compact way to to express them. Um, you write your objective function and you call solve. Um, 
So, okay, that's the code, but is this, is this really all that you need to solve the problem? Um, I have less, left some things out. Where's the solution? It's not really clear what's going on. Um, so here's the, actually the full, complete um, code to run this example. What you do is you import jump. Um, this code at the top defines a data structure uh, for an edge. We, we make a list of edges. We create this model to so say that we want to solve it with GLPK's LP solver, copy paste the code from before, we solve it, and then we get the solution back. So this is using the, the Jupyter notebook environment, um, which works very well with, with Julia. Okay, so this brings us to Julia. What um, I'll, if you haven't, um, looked at this blog post, it gives a pretty good motivation for why um, Julia was developed. This is the blog post that, that was basically part of the, the release announcement for, for Julia in February 2012. Um, this is one of, the, one of the documents that I read and convinced me to start playing around with Julia. Um, and the, the motivation was that um, the creators of Julia, they had a lot of experience in MATLAB, Lisp, Python, Ruby, Perl, R, Mathematica, C, all of the above, um, some of the above. Um, and there was really not one programming language that, that did, did um, a whole chunk of things well. Um, every, there's always trade-offs. If you're using Python, well, then there's a speed trade-off. If you're using C, C++, there's a usability trade-off. There's a lot of trade-offs. Um, and they said that enough of the trade-offs, we want, we want more, of the, more, than, more than what's out there, so let's develop a new programming language. So my, my, my personal take on what makes Julia different on the technical side um, is that it was, as I mentioned, it was designed to be as fast as C and C++ and as dynamic as Python. Um, so historically, there's, there's been a trade-off between being dynamic and being fast, um, and that's no longer the case. And that's no longer the case because Julia uses um, modern compiler technology, LLVM. Um, it uses the compiler as a runtime tool. Um, so this, is, this, is not tech, this technology did not exist 30 years ago when Python was developed. Um, and what's also pretty interesting about Julia is that most of the core library of Julia is written in Julia. There's a little bit of um, C++ interface with the compiler, um, but if you're, if you're developing Julia, the language, um, the kind of the base abstractions, defining how arrays work, um, almost all of that is written in Julia. Um, so if you understand Julia, you understand the core of Julia itself. Um, and also, jump jump is 100% written in Julia. So if you understand Julia, you have the background to understand what's going on in jump. Um, on the other hand, in Python, MATLAB type packages, there's often a, a whole chunk of it that's written in another language like C++. And if you're a user of this package to really understand what's going on, you have to go into a different programming language, um, which creates a really high barrier to to um, contributing to these packages. Um, on top of that, Julia has a pretty active community. Um, there are a lot of people excited about scientific computing, um, differential equations, linear algebra, um, data science, uh, writing web servers. There's people excited about doing this in, in Julia. Um, so if, you, if you're also excited about that, um, it's a great environment to be. And if if you haven't gone to JuliaCon, the annual Julia conference, I'd also recommend that. Um, so that's, that's the positive side. Um, I should also mention the, the negative side. They're still breaking changes. Um, so for example, there's uh, Julia 0 0.7 will be released soon, um, and there's going to be a transition in the in this ecosystem from 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. There's a few breaking changes, there's a few a lot of things have been deprecated and renamed, so pe package authors have to go through their code and update things to, until, there, and, until there will be a nice user experience. Um, there's no currently working debugger, to my knowledge. There's some prototypes, but it's not quite there yet. Um, and there's also fewer online resources. It could be that um, if you have a question, it may be 
maybe there's not, maybe you're the first person to have that question, so there's not an answer already there on, when you go to search for it on Google. Um, so if that, if you're, if the benefits sound great and the and the trade-offs don't bother you, then great, um, go give Julia a try. Um, if not, then maybe wait a year or two. A lot of these issues will go away. Julia will, the, there's a plan to stabilize and release Julia 1.0 um, this year. Um, so it is, you may want to wait a little bit until things stabilize. Otherwise, you can jump in and play around. Um, okay, so let's actually get to the jump part. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about Jump's origins. I know a few people have been using Jump for uh, for quite a while, and that should be an interesting backstory um, about how how Jump has changed over time. Um, a little bit about Jump, uh, the ex extensions, and um, uh, say I would say Jump today. What people have written so far, what we've heard about a little bit at this conference, the community, um, how many people are using it, and then our plans for, for um, the next stage of Jump. Okay, so you, I would call this the, the Jump mission statement, maybe, um, or at least our, what, we're, what we're striving for. And I'll, so I'll, I'll go through the list. Um, what would I want in a programming language? My background, before I started at, at MIT, I was working at Argonne National Lab on large-scale optimization, um, dealing with structured problems, parallel computing. Um, and so I, I was really tuned into the, the performance side of things and being able to um, uh, develop new extensions. Um, so what I personally would want in a modeling language is for it to be embedded in a modern programming language. Um, so for example, optimization, solving an optimization problem might only be one little piece of what your program is. Maybe you um, are running a simulation, maybe you're running a web server, uh, maybe you're solving a sequence of optimization problems and need to do some computation in between. Um, and if you're doing that, it's really nice to be in a full programming language where you have just the ability to write for loops, call functions, read and write data. Um, so that's, that's what I would be looking for. Um, solver independence is pretty important. If you're, uh, if you're in academia, you have to compare a lot of different methods, switch between different solvers. Um, it would be nice to not have to rewrite the code uh, to do that. Um, another thing which is actually pretty unusual for, for modeling languages is to be able to interact with solvers while they're running. Um, and so, for example, callbacks, if you've used callbacks in a MIP solver, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If not, these are functions that you can um, provide to the solver to modify its behavior dur during branch and bound. Um, so during branch and bound, it will call your code and you can uh, do some computations, add some constraints, run some heuristics. Um, and this is a really powerful tool for getting state-of-the-art performance out of, um, out of MIP solvers, and it'd be nice to do that all from, the, from a modeling environment. Um, I would also like the modeling language to be uh, extensible to support specialized problem classes, and I, um, given, given the, t the talks that we've had at, um, at Rodef, I think this is a point, this is a pretty um, strong point for Jump. There are a lot of extensions to for um, block structured modeling, multi-objective modeling, um, uh, stochastic dual dynamic programming. Those are all things that we've heard about at the conference. And these are tools that, um, problem classes that, that maybe I don't know anything about. I, I haven't written any code, but people have looked at Jump, said I can extend it, and they're now useful software built on top of Jump. Um, then finally, the performance aspect, um, the modeling language itself should have less overhead um, than solving the optimization problem. Because really, if you're, if you're spending more time, um, if the modeling language is spending more time generating the matrix than, than the solver is spending solving it, that's not an ideal situation to be in. Um, and unfortunately, that, that it's not too hard if you're in Python or MATLAB to come up with a situation. If you're solving a sequence of linear programming problems, you add it, solve, a, solve a small linear programming problem, add a constraint, solve another one, 
um, it's not hard to get into the situation where um, the overhead from being in this high level language dominates any time you're spending solving the problem. Um, so that, that was kind of what we were thinking about when we started developing Jump. Um, the, so October 2012 was when we started working. Um, Ian and I, um, Joey had not started at that time. Ian and I were, were our first and second year students and we wanted to play around with, with Julia. Uh, so we started a project called uh, JULP, J-U-L-P, which was Julia and, and linear programming. Um, it even included some, some typos, um, obviously bugs, but that, that, this was uh, the beginning of JUMP. Um, we gave our first presentation on JUMP in, well, still JULP at that time, January 2013. The YouTube videos is still up there if, in case you're interested. Um, kind of the, the core ideas were there, but the syntax was very different from what you see today. Um, in February of 2013, we actually re renamed JULP to MathProg. Um, if you've interacted with the with the Julia um, package manager there. At the time, there was kind of an idealistic thing that ev every package should be named according to exactly what it does. Um, so we kind of were suggested to renamed from Julp to MathProg. We did that. Um, we also started, we, sw we switched into something that started looking like the syntax that's, that's there today. Um, and I think that, that MathProg name only lasted for a month or so until we switched to, to Jump finally. Um, May 2013, we submitted our first paper based on Jump with some benchmark results. Um, and the comparison that we ran was to generate a linear programming problem. Um, and write it to a standard file format, LP or MPS. So we're nothing, we're not solving anything, not computing any solutions. We're just generating this matrix and writing it to a standard problem format. Um, and so N is proportional to, to the size of the problem. Um, and these times on, in the grid are, are in seconds. Um, so I don't, I don't want to get too caught up with uh, what's 10% faster or slower um, than, than the other, but I think the main takeaway from this is that if you look at Jump, Ample, and the Groby C++ interface, it's pretty much the same order of magnitude. Um, they're all pretty much about the same, and this is, this is probably not going to be a bottleneck in your, in your computation. Um, if you start switching to Pulp, and this, we, we gave Pulp an advantage here by running it under PyPy, Py, which is a Python accelerator, um, there was still for example, on LPs, there's still a factor of 10 um, uh, overhead there. Uh, Pyomo is, an, is another Python-based modeling language, which at that time did not have the ability to run under PyPy, so this is under standard Python. And you can see that there's a, there's a lot of overhead just in generating these issues, uh, generating these problems. Um, so these, these were encouraging results. Um, so we, we took this and we... Um, kept pushing forward with, with Jump. Uh, we made our first public release, uh, Jump 0 0.1, in October of, of that year. Um, and a couple days later, we had our first bug report, um, which was unfortunate, for, unfortunately a segmentation fault. Um, it, it, it can happen, uh, because Julia is interacting with C libraries, so it, it, it's possible. Um, hopefully not too often. We did fix the issue. Um, and Kind of quickly to summarize um, all, all the features that we've gone through, changes we've gone through, um, the next release of Jump 0 0.2 introduced solver callbacks pretty quickly, um, support for nonlinear optimization, um, semi-definite programming. Um, version 0 0.12, we rewrote <laughs> nonlinear optimization from scratch. Um, 0 0.13, we, we moved away from camel case, um, which is not, uh, the, the, this naming convention is not used too much in Julia, so we moved away from that to the, to the new names. Um, we, if you've seen some old uh, jump code, you'll note that there's the, sum has these curly braces. Uh, we moved um, in December 2016 from the curly braces to the parentheses, because uh, Julia provided a new syntax that, that was a bit nicer. 
Um, so if, if you've seen some old jump code, you'll kind of notice that, that these changes are there. Um, so it's kind of, kind of deciphering old English, modern English. Um, it's good to know what, what, what changes took place. Um, and then one of the big changes that we're going through right now, which I'll spend more time on later, is rewriting our abstractions for solvers, um, and that will become Julia uh, jump 0.19. Um, so let me mention a bit about what, what jump does for nonlinear optimization. Um, I know that it's not, maybe not the most used um, technique for this audience, but some people might be interested. Um, so what, what, what's, what jump does for nonlinear optimization is a user comes and writes down a problem with nonlinear expressions. Um, for example, uh, you might want to call out to IPOPT or, or, or Nitro. Um, and you would, the, what the, the role of jump is to take these expressions that the user wrote down and compute derivatives of them and hand them off to the solver. And the solver will call, will actually call jump in a loop, say what's, what's the gradient of, of F or G at this point? What's the Hessian of, of the Lagrangian of F with, with multipliers? Um, and it's jump's obligation to compute these, these values. Um, so we implemented that, and we, we went a step further beyond what's typ what you could typically do in AMPL and GAMS. And we support user-defined functions with automatic differentiation. So here's um, a little bit of interesting code that if you haven't seen it, it'll kind of challenge your perceptions. Otherwise, if you've seen it, it's, it's very obvious what's going on. Um, we have a Julia function to compute uh, square root by, by applying Newton's method. So just a standard Newton's method application to compute uh, square root of x. You write a, write a while loop, you iterate until um, the gradient is zero, or until equality holds. Um, and that, that's just plain Julia code. Um, and what you can do is uh, create a jump model, regi register this function with jump. Um, so you provide the model, give it a symbolic name, um, tell jump how many arguments it takes. This is a scalar, scalar input function, so it takes one argument. Um, then you say auto diff equals true, and that means that jump will use built-in automatic differentiation techniques to um, compute gradients of this Julia code uh, exact gradients, they're not, there's no finite difference approximation, these are exact gradients, um, and what you can do is now use this function inside of a, an expression um, called solve, and so this, will, this problem will, will maximize uh, the sum of x1 and x2 subject to uh, the square root, uh, so basically norm of, of this vector less than 1. Um, and I have, there's a talk online if you're interested in some of the techniques that we use that we use there. Um, in terms of comparisons to uh, other modeling interfaces for nonlinear optimization, um, we wrote up a few benchmarks. Um, and what we're timing here is the time between uh, when you press enter and when, um, when IPOPT reports that it loaded the problem in memory. Uh, so what you'll see with jump is, Julia has, currently has a bit of a startup cost um, because, as I mentioned, it, it uses the compiler at runtime. So when you start things up, it takes it a little bit of time to warm up and compile the functions. Um, that, might, that could change uh, in the future, but that's basically a, that's a typical experience with Julia. The first time you run something, it's a little slow because it's actually compiling the, the code that you're running. Uh, so there's a bit of a startup cost, um, but as you scale up the size of the problem, um, jump basically very similar order of magnitude to Ample and GAMS, whereas if you look at uh, Pyomo, for example, um, it's 10 times slower um, for the one instance, uh, one of these models to just generate the problem in memory. Um, YALMIP is a MATLAB-based interface, uh, which didn't really, it was not quite designed for nonlinear optimization, even though it supports it, but it doesn't really scale up to these sorts of problems. For computing the derivatives, so, so this was generating the problem, and while you're solving, this, the solver will call back to jump and ask it for 
for derivatives. So the time that it takes jump to do that, um, we're, that's what we're, we're measuring here. Um, and I'd say we're a factor two or three uh, worse than ample and on the same similar order of magnitude as, as GAMS here. Okay, so that's, that's kind of jump itself. There's a lot uh, going on on top of jump um, that's worth mentioning. There's a few over the past uh, year, I've seen a few um, solvers for uh, solvers written purely in Julia. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about Pajarito later. Um, Katana, Juniper, and POD are all developed at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, I, I spent some time there, so they're, now they're um, very happy jump users, as far as I'm aware. Um, these are solvers for mixed integer uh, convex and non-convex mixed integer nonlinear programming. Um, so the, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Pajarito more later. Um, Modeling new problem classes, Jumper uh, was one of the first extensions for Jump to, to support uh, robust optimization. It's not currently being maintained at this moment, but it's a good a proof of concept that this is something that you can do. I'll, I'll show an example of that later. Jump Chance um, is an extension I developed to model probabilistic constraints. So, so you write down I want this constraint to hold with this probability. That's part of the algebraic model, and then the extension um, does a bit of transformations and turns it into a deterministic problem. Um, block decomposition, we heard, uh, we heard about it at RODEF. Uh, piecewise linear optimization um, is a package that provides state-of-the-art uh, mixed integer programming formulations for, um, for, for modeling piecewise linear functions, and these are competitive with or faster than, than using um, for example, SOS2 uh, formulations. Um, Polyjump is a uh, interface for polynomial optimization, sums of squares, VOPT. Uh, we heard about that uh, yesterday. Um, so stochastic dynamic programming is, a, um, again, an extension that we heard about at the conference um, for, for stochastic dual dynamic programming. Um, so Pajarito is, I'll talk about this because this was part of my PhD thesis. Um, it's a hybrid solver for mixed integer convex optimization, or some people, people would call this convex uh, min LP. It's based on uh, polyhedral outer approximation. So what it does is if you have a, you have a convex, uh, set of convex constraints, it approximates the convex constraints by, by hyperplanes, and when you've, when you've approximated by hyperplanes, you have something that you can give to uh, a mixed integer linear solver. Uh, so what ends up happening inside the algorithm is that we solve a sequence of mixed integer linear and convex subproblems, or we can solve a single mixed integer linear problem and, uh, using callbacks and solve convex problems in the callbacks. And the way that this works is that um, the user models their problem, for example, in Jump or even in some other interfaces. They call out to Pajarito. Then Pajarito internally uses Jump to model and solve a MIP and uses other Julia solvers to, to model and solve um, these convex subproblems. So you have the user uh, calling jump, the solver itself uses jump to solve these subproblems, and at the end of the day, it all, all just works and you get your answer back. Um, and our claim about Pajarito is that um, it's the fastest open source um, and the most robust MISOCP solver, so mixed integer second order cone programming. If you restrict your convex sets to second order cones, we get a uh, second order cone, mixed integer second order cone solver. Um, and the fastest open source is kind of a cheap, um, a, a cheap prize because there really, there are not really many mixed integer second order cone open source solvers. So we can claim to be the fastest just because we were kind of the first people to do it well. Um, what you can do, for example, is model these problems with Bondman. Um, but it's, it doesn't work very well because uh, second order cones have points where they're not differentiable. Bondman assumes differentiability. So there are a lot of cases where it just stops, the, the solver crashes because it tried to divide by zero. 
or um, it gives the wrong answer because it was not designed for these types of problems. Um, since Pajarito is uh, built on jump, it's solver independent, we can switch out the MILP solver so we can run, if you provide us an open source MILP solver and an open source conic solver, now we can call ourselves an open source MISOCP solver. Um, so we have some times with uh, using GLPK and CBC. Um, when we go to non-open source, uh, so Skip is academic, but it's, it's not an open source, it's not released under an open source license. Um, it is also capable of solving SOCPs, MISOCPs. Um, when we use CPLEX in a callback fashion, um, we actually, well, we're not able to beat CPLEX on time, um, but in terms of reliability, I would claim that, that we, um, we are able to solve more problems of, on the benchmark sets to the, to the tolerances that we set. Um, again, it's a little tricky to compare solvers like this. CPLEX actually, as far as I'm aware, does not give you a parameter to enforce the feasibility of a second order cone constraint. Um, so as, as, as far as I'm aware, um, you give an MISOCP problem to CPLEX, it will do its best to, to satisfy the constraints, but you, can't, you cannot say I want this constraint satisfied to this tolerance uh, for the second order cone constraints. Um, and in, in our server, we put a lot of effort into being able to guarantee that we can satisfy, um, satisfy all these constraints to, to given tolerances. Um, jumper, as I mentioned, is one of the first jump extensions. What you can do, or what you could do while the code was still working, um, is declare decision variables and declare uncertain parameters. Um, and if you're familiar with robust optimization, what, what this will do is um, you can use uncertain parameters and interact them with your, with your decision variables. And what the extension will do is convert this, either convert this into a deterministic um, problem with the standard reformulation or um, enforce the robust constraints in a, in a cutting plane fashion. Um, moving on to a bit about the, the community around Jump. Um, this was actually, this was a, a book that came out very much to, to my surprise. Someone just announced uh, I think, I think it was two years ago, uh, Chang announced that, oh, I've just written a book um, that uses Jump. So that's great. That means I, I didn't need to write the book myself. Um, saves a lot of time. Um, and if you're, if you're looking for, for a book um, in English with an introduction to Jump and Julia for Operations Research, um, I can recommend this book. I don't get any commissions, I, I, but it seems like a, a good resource. Um, Last year, we held the, the jump, uh, jump Dev workshop um, at MIT. This is a group of people that um, are interested in um, building on top of Jump. People came and say, how do I hook up my solver to Jump? How do I build my extension for Jump? Um, um, actually, this is Oscar, so there is a picture of him on the internet. Um, it was, so this, this was a, a, a fun meetup um, that will end up I'll, I'll give some details about the, the next iteration of this meetup. Um, Hits to, to Jump's documentation over time. Um, basically, so October 2013 was the beginning, zero hits. Um, we, it's been growing at a pretty steady pace over time. Um, and even between 2017 and uh, 2018, we've We've been, a kind of, we've been kind of quiet because we've been developing new features that haven't been released yet. Um, still growing at a reasonable pace. France um, is beating the UK here um, in terms of, of, of hits. Um, uh, hits by country. Um, okay, so, okay. So that, that's Jump. Um, a lot of people come and say, Jump is great, but how do I do this? Um, it's, a, it's a pretty common thing, so we, we, it, it took a couple of years of experience and we've collected, we collected a list of how do I do this questions that really were, posed some, some trouble uh, to, our, to the current design of Jump. 
Um, so for example, how do I add support for a new type of constraint? Maybe you want to do that. Maybe you want to model different uh, classes of constraints. Um, that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, how do I test if a solution is feasible? Again, a very reasonable question. Um, modify coefficients in the constraint matrix. Um, this is something that, again, a pretty reasonable request, but not something that we designed, originally designed Jump to allow you to do. Um, providing dual warm starts. Um, we have some methods, primal dual, uh, nonlinear methods, where maybe you want to warm start both the primal and the dual. Um, getting into the real details here, but if, if this is, if you're, if you're really writing an algorithm that needs to be fast, um, you would want to provide the primal dual warm start and we want to be able to support that. Um, how do I access the irreducible inconsistent uh, subsystem from Groby? Um, that's a, a pretty common question. Um, another fun question is, sometimes a solver stops and it has a feasible solution, and sometimes it stops like because of a time limit and it doesn't have a feasible solution. Um, and if you're, this is something we didn't think about too much, but now when we, when we start to build solvers that use jump internally to solve subproblems, we need to be able to handle these things in a very automatic way. Um, so this is a, another problem that, that caused a little issues. Um, and then this is uh, a fun, fun status that CPLEX might return. Uh, CPLEX can return um, optimal infeasible, which means that CPEX believed to solve the problem to optimality, but cannot return a feasible solution. Um, so what's, what's actually happening there is that it, it solved a pre uh, it pre it solved a pre processed problem to optimality, and when it when it reverts the pre processing, uh, it no longer has a, a solution that satisfies the, the feasibility tolerances, um, and that's just what CPLEX will report this situation to you. Um, and again, if you if you're writing code that, that needs to handle all these cases automatically, it becomes uh, a bit of a, a corner case that we need to start thinking about how do we, how do we report this in a reasonable way. Um, so what jump has, if you, so the reason why these are hard questions to understand, we have to look a bit at jump's architecture. Um, so the, how jump has been set up from, from the beginning to the current release is that you have, we have jump, which is a Julia package, and we have another Julia package called mathprog base, which was named like that because jump was called mathprog for a small amount of time. And mathprog base is this abstraction layer that we use to, to communicate with solvers. Um, so, on, so it's an interface that the solver wrappers implement, um, and jump communicates with mathprog base, um, to, to as an abstraction over the solvers. Um, so if you understand jump and you understand math prog base, um, then it, you understand why these, why these uh, were actually difficult questions for us to answer. Um, so our answer to these questions is, okay, uh, we've, we developed math prog base, we started math prog base in October, uh, or even before October 2013, we've used it for, uh, a bunch of years, uh, we've learned all the corner cases, uh, we've learned what we need from a solver abstraction, so now it's time to throw, throw that code away and, and rewrite things from scratch. Um, so that, this is what we're working on now. It's an interface called, an abstraction layer called MathOps Interface, MOI, or MOE, if you want. Um, what it gives you is a, uh, a new basic representation of, of what, what we call an optimization problem um, in interface for attributes, attributes will let you provide warm stars, access the IIS if you like, um, new, an entirely new system for reporting statuses, um, non-consecutive uh, variable and constraint indices. Um, another question I forgot to put up is how do I delete a constraint? Um, that's a common question and jump, and now, okay, we need to change things around a bit so that we can support deleting constraints. Um, We've moved from solver independent callbacks, so mathprog base currently defines an abstraction for callbacks. Um, we've 
kind of stepped back from that and we're going to go back to solve our specific callbacks. So you'll still be able to use callbacks, but it'll be specific to your particular solver. Um, and the nonlinear optimization is pretty much unchanged. Um, so I'll go through this quickly, but let me give you kind of a preview of the abstraction that we've defined for what is an optimization problem. Um, and our definition of an optimization problem is minimization of f of x. Uh, subject to f sub i of x is in s i, and how do you define these? You define these with very concrete objects uh, called abstract functions and abstract sets. Um, so I think we can all agree that this is, mathematically this is an optimization problem, but the tricky part is what, what, kind of, what are the concrete objects that, we, you, you, that you would use to describe these, these problems. Um, so I'll, I'll go th quickly through this. Um, kind of the standard functions that we came up with is extracting a single variable, uh, ab extracting a vector of variables, scalar uh, affine functions, vector affine functions, quadratic functions, um, and I'll show a bit how this comes together. Um, and the sets, a few of the sets that we've defined is um, the, the less than set, very simple, uh, means x is less than some, um, some parameter of the set, uh, the upper bound. Um, so these, are, these sets help you define linear constraints, for example, or quadratic constraints. Um, the second order cone, it's a nice, nice convex set that you might want to optimize over. We can do that. The set of integers, that's fine. Zero, one, you'd use this to define binary variables. Um, so now we have a whole table of, well, if you choose a function and you choose a set, that defines a mathematical constraint. So for example, if you choose, pick a scalar affine function and the less than set, that would give you a transpose x less than u. That's fine. Um, the difference here, for example, between an affine function and a, this single variable function is that uh, the single variable function can be interpreted as for example, a lower and upper bound, and that has a very important meaning for, for solvers. Lower bounds, upper bounds are different from linear constraints. So that's how we encode the, the difference between a, a variable bound and a linear constraint. Um, quadratic constraints, put a quadratic function in the greater than set, pretty straightforward. Uh, we support bilinear matrix inequalities. Just pick a vector quadratic function and put it in the positive semi-definite cone, that will give you a bilinear matrix uh, inequality. Uh, that's something that we can now formulate and we couldn't formulate before. Uh, discrete and logical constraints, um, binary constraints, um, semi-continuous, semi-integer, uh, SOS1, SOS2, uh, just pick your combination of the function in the set. Uh, I'll skip this. Um, Skip that, and what happens when you get to jump is that MOI is, again, it's an abstraction layer. Most people should not see it. Uh, we're, we're changing everything underneath the hood. We're changing the engine, uh, but this is still something that most users don't need to understand. It's not, it's not part of, it's not the interface to jump. Um, but if you do understand this, then you will know exactly what is going on between jump and the solver, which is very useful for developers when you're, when you're building on top of this. It helps really to know exactly what is going on uh, and how these constraints are translated. So for example, when you create a variable in jump, what jump will do is take a single variable function and a less than set. Um, here's a hypothetical thing that we cannot do right now, but it would be very easy to do. Um, if you might want to define this, uh, this vector affine function, um, in, a, a, in a set of complements, and this would define a complementarity constraint. Uh, so this is something that Jump cannot currently model. With the, now we'll be able to do this very easily. Um, I'll leave this for questions if someone asks it. Um, we have the second Jump workshop, Jump Dev workshop, uh, which will take place in Bordeaux uh, at the end of June. It'll be the week before ISMP. Uh, so if this sounds interesting and you want to learn more about MathOpt interface, want to figure out how to build on top of Jump, how to hook a solver to Jump, um, this, is the, this is the place to be. <laughs>
Um, our plans for, for JUMP, we have a working prototype built on top of, of MOI. Um, it's not quite ready for public testing. There's some obvious things that are, that are missing. Uh, we'll, we'll make an announcement when it's ready for people to, to test out. Um, JUMP MOI will be released, that, that will become JUMP uh, 0 0.19, and the goal is to release this before the uh, JUMP dev uh, workshop. Um, it will require Julia 0 0.7 or later, um, and that sh should be released soon. Um, and the plans for JUMP 1.0, um, that, that will be a big discussion topic at the workshop that we'll figure out, we'll get a bit of feedback first on how MOI is working and decide which, which other changes we w might want to make to JUMP uh, before 1.0. Uh, this is a, a big change that's under the hood. We haven't really changed jump syntax too much, um, and we probably will not. Um, so it's pretty likely that, that once jump uh, MOI stabilizes and we learn what's going on, uh, then that will become jump 1.0. Um, for early adopters, if this sounds exciting and you, and you want to play around with it, um, if you don't mind some things breaking, reporting bugs, uh, getting state-of-the-art performance, um, this, uh, this is a great time to try things out. Um, if, this, if it sounds kind of scary, then I would say wait, wait a year or two. Um, we'll be in a much better situation. Julia 1.0 will be released. Jump 1.0 will be pretty close. Um, that will be a good time for, if you really want the, the, the stable experience, that'll be a, a good time to use Jump. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll thank everyone um, and I'll take your questions.